Welcome to our Nurtured Heart Approach webinar, where you will learn to transform the difficult child and become a more awesome you. I'm Ruby Head. I'm one of your hostesses this evening, along with Star Bond, and I want to let you know that you are definitely in the right place. If you are a parent or a caregiver, maybe you're a foster parent, a teacher, a mentor, a coach, you could be an auntie, an uncle, a grandparent, an educator, someone who cares about youth, then you are definitely in the right place tonight. Why this call is important to you right now, I'm guessing you've probably been struggling or frustrated with the kid in your life. You might be worrying about the future of your child or even the kids in your classroom. You might have had no idea it would be this hard to be a parent right now or to be a teacher in this quarantine scenario or just in general that doing the adult thing with kids could be this crazy making. You might have even had some success, but there could be certain scenarios that bring you to your knees every time and you would love that to not be the case. And I'm guessing you have a suspicion that this whole parenting, teaching, caring for kids thing could actually be more fun. So I want you to take a moment and imagine as a parent, a time when you feel confident, when conversations with your kids are effective, they're respectful, they're clear, your boundaries are solid and they actually feel good and your life isn't taken up by bargaining and pleading and shouting matches and laughing is what's the thing you hear most in your household. It's there's less arguing, the relationships feel really good and you're able to navigate the challenges when they come up with ease instead of being just blown into oblivion. The joy of parenting has re-entered your home. If you're a teacher, I want you to imagine walking into your classroom every day. Your students are great at listening. They maintain focus. And when you give instructions, they follow through and it feels really good and juicy. And you also have the tools to navigate challenges. And at the end of the day, you feel expansive, purposeful, and fulfilled. How awesome, right? Today, we are going to tell you about the nurtured heart approach, why it's awesome and why it's different than every other parenting hack magazine movie out there. there we're also going to share the four myths that are possibly ruining your relationship with the kids in your life, as well as the four truths that lead to guilt free parenting and teaching. Who doesn't want that? three stands of nurtured heart approach, which are amazing. And we're gonna go into those as well as how the nurtured heart approach works, not just for parents, but for teachers, caregivers, and educators as well. All right, I want you to be ready. So grab a pen and paper. You might wanna take notes. Maybe you use your phone. Turn off notifications and distractions as much as possible. I get it. Particularly if you have kids, they're gonna be here and around and that's okay. Stay till the end because we have this very special course coming up where we're gonna take what we learned today and deep dive and give you crazy tools. And we wanna give you a special offer about that at the end. As you're writing those questions down, you can also pop them in the chat. And if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little icon for chat and you can write us questions in there. And I want to say warning, language is probable. We have a New Yorker in the house and sometimes words come out. So if you have little ones and that's a problem, put on headphones. All right, you guys, who are we? These crazy girls in the hats. Well, I'll let you know, I am Ruby Head and I am a nature mentor and educator and a coach. And I have been doing this work for 20 years. I love working with youth. I love connecting with parents and I am passionate about giving people tools to help create ease and fun and joy in their lives and in their relationships. And my co-partner here today, bringing you Nurtured Heart Approach is Star Rose Bonds. You have to unmute yourself though. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. Hi. Thank you for that intro. Um, so I'm Star. A couple of you know me, obviously. And I am a clinical uh, licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a personal life coach. I am a New Yorker, nestled away in the woods of Northern California. And real briefly, just so you have an understanding of my background, I'm a social worker at heart. I've worked in a variety of different settings for the past 12 to 15 years. Um, I was employed through the International Rescue Committee, so I was working with refugees and asylees. I worked in harm reduction and needle exchange. 
um, with sex workers across the nation and human trafficking. I've also done a tremendous amount of work in the correctional facilities um, and working with uh, high-risk youth and also children in after-school settings and after-school programming. Right now, I am, like I said, nestled away in Northern California. I work at a local treatment center here, and I do all the trauma-informed therapy and group uh, curriculum, and I train a lot of the staff here in our county on ways to be trauma-informed. And I also have a private practice where I see couples, individuals, and I am incredibly passionate about uh, motiv motivating parents to get involved in NHA as a primary tool, not only for parent-child uh, relationships, but for couples as well. So my story real quick before you know why I did this and why I got into this. Um, I am a mama of an 11 year old boy and I've been on my own with him since birth. So I've done the single, uh, single, mother, single mothering vibe. And for many years we were going along and it continued to become more and more challenging. And he was often labeled as an intense child or a challenging child or was struggling in either in school or at home and his level of impulse control, irritability, disrespect, um, hyper, hyper vigilance or hyperactivity was always kind of on the board in some way, shape or form. And so for me, here I am as a successful therapist, I built a practice, I'm doing well in ABC, different varieties of my life. And then behind closed doors, I was deeply struggling with my child. And interestingly enough, and I, when I say deeply struggling, I mean like really struggling, like, tears on the floor of my, you know, kitchen floor crying, you know, screaming, yelling, not knowing what to do, being in a cycle of guilt chronically. And then I discovered NHA. Somebody told me about uh, the Nurtured Heart Approach, actually a client of mine, a CPS client, and I picked up the book and I devoured it in two days. I devoured this book and lo and behold, I started implementing the practices immediately and I didn't see results in like a month or a year or over time. It was literally within 48 hours, I started to see little shifts in the way that we were engaging each other. And I started to relax into the way I chose to approach my son. And it went from a couple days being better to a week to a month. And now we're several years in and we have an entirely different relationship that is rich and dynamic and nourishing. Um, and conscious with boundaries. And we don't have big blowouts anymore. I'm not saturated in guilt all the time. And the power struggles no longer exist. I was so deeply inspired by the approach that I actually went to Fargo, North Dakota for a week and became a trained facilitator. Came back and now I have, count, I have contracts, with count, with, contracts with different uh, providers all over the county where I teach NHA, I teach them in the school districts here, and I've been able to use it, not just with my child, so it's my own personal story, but I've watched it reclaim the lives of some of the most challenging situations right here in, in, in my own community. So I know that it works with children who've been diagnosed, uh, ADHD, ODD, uh, hyperactive, uh, PTSD, and then it works with the average child. So as we go into the um, presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about some different examples where it has shown up, not only in my life, but in the work that I've done with some of the other, uh, with some of my other clients. Okay, so I'm going to jump in and we're going to get right into the presentation. So I'm going to do a share screen with you. Let's see. Can you see that one? We good? Hold on. Here we go. Thumbs up. All right. And as we're going through it, so I can get your vibe either in the chat, if you could give me like a head nod or you can give me a thumbs up, you're like, I'm totally feeling this. I can totally relate to this. I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Like, just go there with me so I can like feel, get a feel for what's happening. All right. So I want to present real quick, Howard Glasser. He is the creator of NHA. I had the privilege of being able to work with him personally over the training. And he is a very interesting guy. He's a genius in so many different ways. And his, uh, this, NHA is his brainchild. So this philosophy and this modality came out of not only him being a very quote unquote intense child, he was the kid that grew up who burnt down his garage, stabbed his brother with a pencil, was expelled from multiple schools. Um, so he had firsthand experience with being stigmatized as that type of kid. And then like most therapists who are deemed something or labeled something, you know, we go off to become therapists. <laughs> and so he went into practice and started working with families and children and realized there were some really salient pieces around energy flow and the way parents were condition, uh, conditioned to operate with their children that was oftentimes exasperating a situation with an intense child. And so through the work of his practice with children and parents for many, many years and his own personal experience, he birthed NHA. And I can tell you, it is nothing short of 
of brilliance. So I want to dive right into what it is and why it works and who it works for. So NHA started as a way to really heal challenging children. Um, and so as you know from his book, it's called Transforming the Difficult Child. And what we found out is that the nurtured heart was in fact developed for that type of kid, but it actually works for all children. So we really encourage people that when you are in a family setting or a group setting or in a classroom setting, you don't want to just isolate one kid through this practice. It benefits everyone. And it simply isn't just for the children. And you're going to hear me say it as a relationship coach it's not only great for children, it's great for couples. So it's a relational model. We're just doing a parenting class right now, but we're gonna wrap it around all together. Um, so I encourage you as we take a look at this framework, look at ways in which you can apply it across the board. And you really, I wanna encourage you that when you are in a family setting to use it with all because it will actually backfire if you end up isolating it with one child. So let's start off with this. In this society, the concept of intensity, right, is often deemed really negative. It's a negative connotation. And coming from a woman who's been labeled intense her whole life, um, I can really, really relate to this and some of the stigma placed around that. So what we know about is intensity is that we have symptoms and symptoms do exist. We're not going to negate that, but symptoms are often labeled and they're pathologized. And what that does is that often places a understanding or a stigma on a child that forces us to look at them in ways that they are irritable, cranky, problematic, challenging, um, resistant, incorrigible, unpleasant, and then we develop a lens about them based on this. We also misunderstand these labels and this pathology by kind of digesting them as they have chemical imbalances, brain dysfunction, um, and then our first line of action is oftentimes to not only diagnose but then medicate. And so NHA takes a really strong stand on the idea that we're not in opposition to medication, but we do feel that medication is overutilized in this society tenfold. We are the most overdiagnosed, overmedicated cohort of human beings on planet Earth right here in America. And so, again, we're not saying to throw the baby out with the bathwater in the sense around medication, but if we have a model that can address behavior and address attitude without the need of pharmaceuticals, then we should use that as a first line of action before going to medication. And so medication should really be a last resort. And what we have found is, is with children who've either been on medication or have been referred to use medication, have adopted NHA, and over time, there has been less need to use medication altogether or the children were able to be weaned off of it. So that's the beauty around it. Um, the other thing that we know when it comes to pathology and diagnosis is that it's a blanket over the intensity. It doesn't actually fix the issue. And so it gives a temporary relief of what's actually going on and we never get to the root of the issue. And so what we wanna understand is that our current view around intensity is very negative and with nurtured heart, we value the level of intensity because I want to remind you that the people who carry an intensity, they're the ones who move mountains. They're the ones who find cures for diseases. They're the ones who have, you know, double master's degrees and just keep going. So there's an intensity that's your life or it's your chi. And so when it's harnessed and channeled effectively, they are the people, they are the influencers and they are the people that do boss stuff in this life. And so we want to encourage our children, right, to harness that energy in a way that's productive and constructive and healthy without the label without the pathology. Um, so with that, one of the myths that we know, hold on, I have to move my thing, hold on, oops. So is intensity in a child is bad and often leads to diagnosis, pathology and medication. Whereas the truth really is, is that seeing an intensity for what it is, is a deep sensitivity and a really powerful gift. And so NHA is really geared on offering up that new mindset. Additionally, when it comes to a lot of conventional practices around parenting, conscious parenting, positive parenting, which in a lot of ways have become trigger words for me, all they do oftentimes is they create perhaps a temporary sense of improvement. And from NHA, like improvement in, isn't enough. We are really going for deep organic transformation from the inside out. Conventional methods, um, are awesome for the average kid. And this is where we often fail as a culture and as a society is that the middle of the road kid is gonna to respond to some of those conventional practices. But oftentimes when it comes to the difficult child or the intense child, those types of practices tend to backfire um, and tend to exasperate the situation as I talked about in the beginning. And they oftentimes inadvertently make the situation worse. And so with the conventional method, right, 
we end up in a school setting specifically, we end up having teachers who are trained in a lot of conventional methods. And although maybe only 15 to 20 percent of their classroom is considered difficult or intense, 80 to 85 percent of our resources get channeled to that 15 percent population. And so it's important to understand how these conventional practices don't meet the needs of all children. And so NHA, the beauty about that, has that potential, has that possibility. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that when parents aren't essentially energetically in alignment with the conventional practices, they ultimately don't work. So I hear parents all the time trying to, they'll read a book or they'll read an article or they'll watch some clip and they'll try to implement a new way of being with their children, but it doesn't really feel good to them. And if it doesn't feel good to you, it doesn't feel good to your children. And they're gonna notice that and they're gonna pick up on that. And that's not gonna be a workable option in many ways. So, I want to talk about at the heart of what really NHA does. So we are capitalizing on their intensity in a really, really powerful way. We're teaching to harness, but more importantly, above and beyond anything is that we are building inner wealth. And we use the term inner wealth interchangeably with confidence, with inner strength, self-efficacy, because as we know, we live in a modern world. And right now, modern world equals more stress. So not only do adults and parents and caregivers need to be more resilient, more confident, so do our children. And so what we want to do is we want to help build children's sense of security, sense of self-esteem, so that as they navigate the world around them, they can do it with a, with a sense of inner strength. Um, many of the conventional practices that we have oftentimes teach children through a really kind of informational or informational component where we teach children to regurgitate, you know, talking points, just say no, you know, don't do this, don't do this please do this, act like this. But ultimately, if a kid doesn't have a sense of security or self-esteem or self-efficacy, they are not going to be equipped to make those healthy choices moving forward. So we can push information and rhetoric down a kid's throat all day long, but if they don't feel good about themselves, they are much more likely in the face of doing drugs, having sex, engaging in a high-risk activity. If they don't feel good about themselves, they have a much higher likely of subscribing to those to those acts, right? Whereas if you have a kid who's never been around those types of curriculums or those types of programs, but has a strong sense of self, feels good about who they are, has a sense of inner trust and wellness, they on the other hand are going to have not only the emotional development to be able to go out into the world and speak from confidence, but the beautiful part about NHA is that we're working with their neurobiology. So NHA actually supports the fostering of that higher emotional state. So even if you're working with a kid at six, seven years old through this relational model, we are literally supporting that healthy brain production and those neural networks so that at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, they can go out into the world and make positive choices. So for me, it's kind of like a lot of preventative health care in that respect. And I really love that idea of priming a child's brain, right? Instead of giving him talking points or her talking points to go out into the world, I'm actually priming her neurobiology to go out into the world to function at a much higher level than her peers and make positive choices from a physiological standpoint. Um, so a strong kid who's arrived at their, at their um, inner wealth oftentimes is going to be more resilient. They are going to be able to navigate adversity and they're going to be able to have the language and the verbiage to communicate when things aren't going well. And at the end of the day, that's what we want with our children. So just real quickly before I jump in, I'll just mention this. For me, I have a child who again has multiple things on board. We've got Lyme's disease, we had impulse control issues, he has motor tics um, that show up when he's anxious in school, um, and he has a variety of different uh, competing issues, uh, both health and emotional. He also has a processing issue, so he takes, he has an IEP at school. Now you would think a kid with that kind of stuff on board would really be suffering, and I can tell you, with the use of NHA, I have watched my child reclaim a sense of confidence and self-esteem. And despite having these adverse components in his life, as all, human, as all humans do, he is able to move through them with grace, with confidence, with security, and more importantly, which I didn't think was coming, with humor. So he's able to navigate this life through a way of both self-respect, and oftentimes it becomes something that he can connect and bond over in a funny way. And so I can't tell you how much joy that brings to my heart because in this day and age we are facing bullying we're facing kids that have learning disabilities because not every child learns the same 
we are facing all sorts of experiences around adversity. And when we can give them an approach where I'm not telling him, it's okay, honey, you're going to feel better, or don't worry about that. And I'm trying to calm him through my own words of effort, that he actually has access to that himself. So the three stands that I want to jump into is when we look at NHA, they're really specific. And as we go through the six week course, we dive super deep into them. But in a nutshell, it's stand one, absolutely no. Stand two, absolutely yes. And stand three, absolutely clear. And I want you to notice that we use the term stand. So the reason why we do that, it's very purposeful. We take a stand in the sense that we are very clear and specific and deliberate about what we are doing and how we're going about this methodology. The most important thing about the core methodology of these three stands is that we use them in tandem or in confluence with one another. So we're never just gonna use one and not the other. And when I teach NHA to people and they come back and they say, oh, it's not working or, oh, I'm having a challenge, I know that something needs to be notched up or they're not being used together. Maybe you're using all of stand two and maybe very little of stand three or vice versa. So it's the idea that we're gonna use this model in confluence with one another. So I'm gonna break down for you the concept of Toys R Us. And I really, really love this metaphor. There's a couple of them I'm gonna teach you that really help me relate and understand what NHA is all about. So for many of us as parents and as caregivers and teachers, we are our kids' most exciting toy. We are the ultimate entertainment center. We have bells and whistles and we have loud voices and we have colors to our face when we scream and we have hands that move. And if you're a New York Italian, you're really big and you're really loud. So children know what to do to get us going. And just like any child, right? When we have a toy or we give them a toy, what happens? They play with it, they learn it all, they know what's up with it, they do all the different things to it, but the moment that they figure everything out and there's no longer any more intrigue or excitement, where do we find those toys? They're usually under the bed. Mine go out into the backyard where he thinks I can't see them, right? Or they find them in the garbage. But nevertheless, the moment a child gets bored is the moment that they're done playing with that toy. And everybody thinks that the worst feeling a kid could go through is like despair or depression or anxiety, blah, blah. No, that's not the case at all. Actually, the worst feeling for a kid to feel is boredom. And anybody who's been in a car ride with a kid knows this. So what I want to encourage you to understand is that when you become a part of your relationship with your child where you're no longer this entertainment center in a way from a negative perspective or through a negative reaction, you're going to flip the script. So children know how to press your buttons, how to get you going. And when things aren't going well, you're going to give them a ton of excitement, ton of bells, tons of whistles. So what we want to do is we want to help you create a new, uh, a new script to the way that you interact with your children. So what I mean by that is when things are going well, oftentimes we have a more generic response, right? So good job, way to go, that's great, honey. Whereas when things are going bad, we're really big. So I know for myself, I always use this example. I can remember years ago getting in a fight with my son coming home from a baseball game where he ate a hot dog and threw it and we got this big fight and I pulled the car over to tell him how angry I was and process with him and make a big scene. I have never pulled the car over to tell my kid how awesome he is or what a great job. I didn't rip the car over and be like, you know what? You're amazing. Great job at school. That's never happened because we don't do that, right? We make a big scene when things are going bad. Whereas when things are going well, it's kind of like lackluster. So children learn in order to get the most bells and whistles out of you, I have to be a punk. I have to do something fresh. I have to be disrespectful. So I'm going to say something. And a lot of parents don't like this, mom. I'm just be real. Children, children don't really give a shit about what you say. They don't. There's a few things that they'll listen to, but ultimately children care how you make them feel. Okay. So when you look back in your life and you think about the things that your parent told you, I remember a couple. My mom told me to wear my seatbelt and to never litter. Other than that, I remember how I felt as a child, right? So for kids, they want energy all the time. And children who are difficult, challenging, intense, abused, traumatized, require a high level of intimacy. So again, they don't care about the content, they care about the energy flow. And if they've realized that kissing you off gets them the most bang for their buck, that's the way they're gonna channel their energy. So the myth too is that damage is done, it's too late for this kid. And what NHA is here to tell you is that it's a relational support and it's never too late. And it supports emotional and biological healing long-term. So we wanna look at choosing more energy. 
obviously, for example, I just give you the concept around, it's just about, it's not about context, it's about energy flow. If I were to hold up a $50 bill and a $100 bill, and I was like, pick one, we all know what y'all would pick, right? Children are doing the same thing. If I'm going to yell and scream and freak out versus like give a little pat on the back or way to go kid, we know that the kid is gonna go for that bigger energy flow. So we wanna help you flip the scale on that so the child can feel the contrast or the difference between really upping the ante when things are going well and really starving the energy when things aren't going well. So that's what stand one is all about. I refuse to energize negativity and I will no longer reward negativity with my energy, connection, or relationship. So remember, pulling over the car, right? My kid, even though that was a crappy situation, he got like 15 minutes of my undivided, crazy, angry attention. And he didn't care what I was saying, but there I was, one-on-one -on -one with him. And my kid wants me as a connection, and that's the reality. So I want you to think about that in all the experiences. And I'm a therapist, so I have processed the shit out of my kid. Like my kid has like, you know, 65 year old therapist jargon as his vocabulary because I have over processed with him because so much positive parenting is about, let's talk about your feelings. Let's talk about why you didn't do that. Let's blah, blah, blah. And even in that, they are still getting rewarded for the negative energy, right? By having this big, long processing. So I want a lot of parents who are like, well, we were talking about their feelings. Kids know they're not supposed to hit. Kids know they're not supposed to spit on somebody. Kids know that they're not supposed to lie. You don't need to process that with them anymore, right? Similar when you learn a language. You don't need to teach somebody. Once they learn the word cat, you don't say it over and over again. They just know it. So I want to give you an example. This is not, I'm going to be really clear. This is not an example of NHA, but what this does show, it illustrates the way in which a child, when there's no uh, affirmative prop on how to get the connection, a child will act in a very unusual way. And we watch this happen all the time. So. Okay, so I'm gonna pause there. With that particular clip, what that child was doing, as you could see, the child was walking around and when things were going well, nobody was noticing the child. Nobody was connecting with the child. No one was tuning in with the child. So then the child's like, well, what do I need to do connection? I'm gonna throw myself down on the ground because when I cry, maybe somebody will come up and see me. And so when the child wasn't getting connection in any way, shape or form, they will go to extremes to figure out how to get it. We are a relational species. Humans need human connection as much as they need food and water. And we will go out of our way to access that. That is what the essential core understanding of between attachment theory, right? Avoiding the attachment, insecure attachment, and secure attachment. How often did a child receive healthy connection and secure attachment, right? And so what we have found, interestingly enough, is that when a child doesn't know how to get healthy connection or healthy attachment, they will go to really, really big efforts and big ways to get it. And so this is what we often find in children who are acting out in school, being really disrespectful. And the problem is, is that it's often seen as attention seeking. And the truth is, is that children are really connection seeking. And because the moment we say attention seeking, it becomes dismissed or degraded or disregarded as an essential need. So the other thing that we see show up oftentimes in positive parenting, and again, I'm going to use that because I'm not going to give out any, you know, specifics, but in a lot of the conscious parenting models is to ignore the behavior. But that works for the middle of the road kid. For my kid, no. He's going to up the ante. So ignoring just invites kids to do shit that's crazier than. So there's a point my son knows if I were to ignore things, let me just get bigger. Let me just break something bigger. Let me just be bolder because the intense child is waiting and knowing your breaking point. So the other problem about ignoring is that it's a passive experience. So what you're doing is, instead of being in tune to your child, you're tuning your child out in that moment. So you're refusing to energize the experience 
When, when you do that and you do it from the place of ignoring, you're no longer connected to the experience. So instead, we're gonna talk about pausing that energy. And when you pause the energy flow, what you're doing is it's actually quite active. You are pausing the energy flow and the connection, but you're standing on the sidelines waiting for that behavior to cease so that you can jump right back in and return to the connection. This is very different than the idea of just simply ignoring negative behavior. So this right here I want to talk about is video game theory. And for me, this is like a really, really interesting thing. Once this really broke down to me when I was reading the book feverishly for like 12 hours straight, I was like, oh my God, this made so much sense. And I want to be clear, I'm not condoning video games in any which way, but this theory is really quite uh, poignant. So we know kids who are into video games oftentimes can focus on homework and playing a video game with like complete mastery and accomplishment. They are excelling, they are into it, they are uh, excited to be a part of it, they have this unwavering focus, right? And in the game, not only are they enthusiastically involved, but life truly makes sense to them. And so for many, it's very different than home or school. Video games have this really uncanny, abil uncanny ability to compel kids to successfulness. So what I mean by that is that video games generally are very incentivizing. When you are involved in a video game, right, there is all sorts of, first of all, especially nowadays with the graphics, you play a video game and honestly, I feel like I'm tripping. There's so many colors, there's so much action. There's like lots of enthusiasm going on. It's like ding, 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 colors, coins everywhere. And there's constant aspects or avenues to win, to incentivize, to go further, to do better, right? There's never anybody little blurb popping up being like, hey, you know, don't go this way. We don't really want to, you know, we don't want that thing to happen that happened last Tuesday. Or there's no like processing or there's no like bickering little, you know, gnome that talks to you. Everything is about winning. And so the beautiful part about this is that not only is it incentivized, but it's very much captured in the moment. So it's present to present to present. So you're taking everything by the moment, which children really honor and love because children are very present. The other thing is the game is never in a bad mood, right? So unlike mom, some days when I do yoga and I drink my green juice and I'm feeling all good about life and I have got, you know, I got to meditate that morning. My kid gets like nine mornings. Right, but then when I'm having a bad day and I'm stressed out and I'm PMSing, my kid gets no warning. So I'm not predictable in that sense. Video games, they are very predictable and they're consistent. Like I said, when you play a video game and if you die or you lose a life or you knock into something, there's no blurb that comes up and tells you, you know, that you should really be ashamed of yourself or I'm really disappointed in you or please don't do that again. You were here on Tuesday and we already saw that happen then. Like that doesn't happen. The moment you lose your life or you lose points, it's very unceremonious. It's a very simple consequence. You lose a life, right? You suffer the consequence, you lose the coins, whatever it is, and you immediately jump right back into the game for winning. So the idea is, is that losing or doing something negative or not following the rules doesn't result in a whole lot of action. It's actually quite boring and simplistic. And then the moment you suffer the consequence, you are right back in the game, right back in the present moment, and there's not a single thing on the game that'll ever hold you to who you were five minutes ago or who you were to hold you to who you were a week ago. And that's the really fabulous part. So a kid never has to be confronted with the idea of, I'm not good enough or I can't get better. And in fact, there is so much promotion on seeing them get better and wanting them to get better and wanting them to continue to thrive. And so kids, naturally, when it comes to video games, start to develop an intrinsic motivation to keep going, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when they don't understand the level, because they have little cheerleaders throughout the game supporting and promoting them every step of the way. The point in telling you that is that we want you to start to parent children like a video game concept in the sense that you deliver the consequence always. It's unceremonious. Your rules are really clear and predictable. You're constantly confronting your child with an opportunity for success and your incentives are fun, strong, and predictable. And just like I talked about your favorite toy, right? You are your kid's favorite toy, believe it or not. Even if they told you F you a million times, and even if they've slammed doors in your face, and even if they say they hate you, underneath all that, they actually really want to be connected to you. And part of that looks like is, when it comes to NHA, you have to feel yummy. You have to feel fun. You have to feel exciting and juicy in order for them to want to engage in this activity with you. Most parents feel tired and depleted and angry. So 
the children don't get the understanding or have the contrast between having a really fun mom or fun grandma or fun dad because they're tired and cranky and fed up and powerless. And so then when we go to assign a consequence, it doesn't really work. If you have a crappy relationship with your kid or you're an angry parent and you send your kid to your room or to their room or for a timeout, they don't care. They're happy to get away from you. That consequence does not have the impact that you want. So I want to talk about stand two and then what that looks like. Stand two is absolutely yes. I will relentlessly create and energize positive experiences and I will energize and nurture firsthand experiences as they show up. And so this is the juicy part. This is what I love about NHA. And this is what really kind of altered the way I interact with my kid. So oftentimes in parenting education, we look for kids to uh, catch them when they're being good. The problem with that is if you have a kid with a diagnosis, you have a challenging kid, you have a difficult kid, you have an obstinate kid, catching them being good, you might be waiting around all day for that. <laughs> so it can be really challenging, exactly. <laughs> so what we want to do in that respect is we want to lower the bar and create opportunities for your child to feel successful every step of the way. It's not to say we take away that bar. My kid has a high expectation as to who I know he can be in this world. But the challenge is, is that he might not be able to jump from here to here. I might need to help him incrementally get there. So it's not about taking away the standard of the bar of who I believe you can be, but I'm gonna cheerlead you on a more incremental level every step of the way. So how we do that in NHA is that we use authenticity. We use being stronger, more specific ways of showing up, being present, to navigate around their, def their defenses, to give evidence of greatness, and to ensure that it's really felt. So it's not just a lackluster comment of like, oh, that's great, or great, you know, way to go, or that's beautiful. We really take the time to recognize, go deep, have an authentic connection, and also reflect back to the child what does it tell you about who they are and who they're becoming? So that's very different. So I'm going to give you a brief example. Now, I think as a therapist prior to NHA, I was positive parenting. But what I realized is that, again, my celebratory moments of when things were going well were actually quite limited and relatively boring. So if my kid came to me and showed me a drawing that he made, I would be like, oh, that's beautiful, honey. And I meant it. But when you have a kid, right, who's gotten in trouble at school at that day, who's picked a fight, who's being disrespectful, and I've channeled a shit ton of energy towards him for being totally inappropriate and disrespectful, and then when he shows me a picture that he's really proud of and the only thing I say is that's beautiful, that's not a whole lot of fuel there. So now when my kid shows me a picture, I pause, I put everything down, and I look. I notice his lines and the way that he patterned them. I notice the colors that he used. I notice where he put the sun on the paper. And what I do is not only do I notice it, I acknowledge it and I verbally recognize it. And then I tell him, what is that expressing about him? Hey, I noticed that you used pastels in this paint, you know? That really shows me that you're being really selective in your color contrast. And I notice that your lines are thicker over here. You're really specific to detail. So I actually take the time out to notice, and this is the thing, every human wants to be recognized and noticed on a very deep level across the board, whether you're six months old or you're 65 years old. And so if you don't get noticed at any point in time, especially in childhood, it's interesting. We go out of our way in our adult years to go big, to get noticed. So maybe you're an overachiever. Maybe you have to be perfect at things, right? Maybe you act out a lot. Maybe you have a loud, boisterous personality because you really need to be noticed in the world. We will go to extremes to get noticed. And so part of recognizing our children in these incremental ways builds confidence, gives them that emotional nutrition that they need. And then it also gives us the opportunity that when things aren't going well, to starve that energy. Now they get to feel the contrast mom, dad, grandma, teacher feels really freaking fun and exciting and joyous when things are going well. And they're really into what I do. I see this with teenagers all the time. A lot of teenagers feel, oftentimes you hear from parents or teachers, they're hard teenagers, we don't wanna work with them or they're just, you know, they're, they're frustrating. But so many of the things that teenagers do parents make a choice not to relate to them. So when your kid comes home at 16 years old and is listening to a certain type of music or dressing a certain way, instead of criticizing or not liking or not approving, because you're not here to approve of everything they do, you just recognize, I see that you're listening to that song again. 
that shows me that you're really getting into hip hop. Or I see you, you know, wearing that outfit again. I see you're really liking pink. You're not here to approve of everything that you kid, your kid does or even agree with them. You're here to recognize them and see them for who they're becoming. And that is one of the most powerful ingredients that you can do as a parent, powerful efforts. So myth, th myth three is kids should know better or should have a bare minimum knowledge. And what I mean by this is that I hear all the time from parents, right? When they, you know, perhaps they do really simple things. When I say lower that bar, what are ways that you can really promote and see your child as doing things well? And they're like, my kid doesn't do anything well. In fact, he just, you know, he's disrespectful all day long. Did your kid take the shoes off before he walked in the house? Did your daughter put her dirty clothes in the hamper? Did your son get up and go to school and get there on time today? And the first response I hear all the time, well, they should do that. That's the least that they could do, right? And what happens is we end up taking advantage or we take for granted our children because this is the thing. Any child on planet Earth, I don't really know too many who want to get up at 7 a.m. and get to school or rush home to do their homework or take a shower every night or empty the dishwasher. My kid would live in utter filth if I let him. He would be dirty and gross. He would never take a shower. He would eat pizza every day if he could, right? And there would be mud all over my house and God knows what else, right? And he sure as hell wouldn't get up at 7 a.m. for school. He would probably show up at like 1 p.m. So this is the thing. Children are constantly accommodating us and our schedules and our adult lives and our, you know, industrialized, you know, society. Children, believe it or not, are, or believe it or not, are showing up. No kid wants to make their bed or put the clothes in the dirty clothes. They don't care about that. So when they do, when we talk about lowering the bar, they might not be coming home and bringing you flowers and offering great praise to you as a parent, but I bet you there's few things that you can find where they are doing it and they are accommodating to your needs, your schedules and the schedules of adults. So those are the things that we want to pride ourselves on and that we really want to jump into. This is an example. I love this video so much and I really love this teacher. She is a teacher in North Carolina where their whole district, I think it's their whole district or maybe just be the school specific where they are all NHA certified. And this is an example of taking the time out to energize success and really jump into stand two. What would you like to use more lab? A cat. Zoom one in tribe two, what would you like to use Brianna? A dog. Boys and girls, you just work so well together right there. Thank you for not fighting and feuding over what we were going to choose in that group. And tribe four, what would you like to choose? Um, Angela. Uh, a frog. A frog. Boys and girls, put your eyes on me before we do our vote. Let me just take a moment right here to say, during that process, no one fussed, no one was fighting, no one was saying, pick me, pick me, I want my answers. You could have been doing all of those things. You could have been fussing and feuding and yelling about what you wanted, but you were respectful to each of your classmates in your tribe. You know what that shows? It shows discipline. Exactly, Brianna. Thank you, Haley. And it shows teamwork. It shows you are disciplined first graders and you have teamwork. Kiss your brains for that. So I love that part. At the very end, she says, kiss, me, kiss your brains for that. I think that's the cutest thing. So this is an example where we have an ordinary teacher in an ordinary classroom, right? Where she went out of her way when things were going well to notice, acknowledge, group and individually recognize what was happening. And it took all of what, nine seconds, 10 seconds? And so one of the things I hear all the time in terms of like a rebuttal around NHA when I'm first starting to teach it in a classroom setting or with parents and educators is, I don't have time to recognize my kid all day or take these big moments out and drop in deep. And as we know, anybody who has an intense child or a difficult child in a classroom or in your home, you spend and allocate so much time to disciplining, yelling, punishing, having special talks, having to come up with a, you know, a consequence. And then if it gets really gnarly and it gets bad and you've done a lot of yelling and screaming, there's a whole guilt cycle that comes along with that. So there's a ton of energy wasted there often a ton of tears, and there's a whole lot of cleanup that has to come from that. So when I hear people say, I don't have time for that, I call the BS card every single time because you absolutely can take cumulatively 10, 20 seconds, 30 seconds outside of your day, four to five times a day 
to drop in with the people that you love, that you people that you care about, because those drop-ins, that 10 second recognition goes a very, very long way. And so again, it goes back to that preventative healthcare in so many ways. Where do you want to put your energy and what is it doing to bring forth a better future, a better tomorrow, maybe just a better dinner time? So um, I want to express this, that this in and of itself is the bare bones of NHA when I talk about the recognitions. When we do the uh, six-week course, we really dive deep into all the ways that we uh, differentiate recognitions, the way that we create opportunities to celebrate, and the way that we create opportunities to really enhance and cultiv cultivate a child's greatness. But in a nutshell, bare bones, NHA recognitions look like this. What do you see? What is happening? What is not happening? And what does it say about the person and who they're growing and how they're becoming? And so when I say what is not happening, that means we're now teaching rules and teaching values in the times when things are going well versus trying to teach them when things are crazy. So when you've got two kids in the backseat of the car, right, who typically hit each other, that's a time when we talk about, let's use nice hands, let's be kind, let's use nice words. And it's usually in a crisis moment when they can't even really receive that lesson anyways. In NHA, we take the opportunity when the two kids in the back of the seat are not hitting and they are being respectful. We pause and we notice that and we acknowledge that. And so not only are they getting a lot of emotional nutrition from you, but now you're teaching a value and a rule when things are going well. That is the awesomeness of NHA right there. So what we're looking at is we wanna build the foundation first. When we talk about stand three and clear boundaries and resets, we don't actually implement them until we have the solid foundation in place. So just like when you would build a house, you would never build the third floor or the attic without the basement and the first floor, right? So building the foundation looks like you're really, really solid in stand one. You're no longer energizing negativity, right? Because if you're not solid in that, then the positives can't have that intended impact, right? If you're still expressing a lot of current, a lot of energy when things aren't going well, but also offering praise, it's gonna be like that baby in the beginning. They're not gonna know how to receive the most connection from you, right? So getting really solid in stand one is critical. Stand, stand two is creating that time in. Is it juicy? Is it established? Does it feel good? And once that's in place, once mom feels really awesome and fun and exciting, or dad or grandpa, whoever, math teacher, now, the concept of timeouts or reset can actually work. Like I said, if you're an aggro, bitter, angry, guilt-ridden, depressed parent or educator, when you go to give a timeout, your kid's going to be stoked. They're going to be like, great, I don't want to deal with you either. And so now you're in a situation where the power play is still, at, still happening and neither of you are really getting what you want. You're just creating more patterns of avoidance. So once you have a solid foundation in place, the limit setting can be super effective. And this is what stand three is all about. So stand three is I set and enforce clear limits and clear consequences in an unenergized ways. I always provide a true consequence. So we talk about the concept of video game theory, right? So setting a clear standard for an intense child, for a difficult child, for the hyperactive child, right? The, this is one of the most important pieces. I can tell you with my son, I live in an area, I have like an acre, and, and when we go out onto friends who have big property, if I say, don't go where I can't see you, that's not a good recommendation for my son because that's very elusive. My son's gonna come back and be like, oh, I thought you could see me even though I was like gone for three hours. No, if I say to him, don't go past the fence perimeter, that's really clear. There's no misunderstanding what I just said. So if you choose to do that, if you choose to go past the perimeter, there's gonna be a consequence, but there's never gonna to have to be a conversation of, did you understand what I meant? Because they were clear the boundaries. More importantly, if you do break that, you know, um, that uh, request, I'm going to give a consequence each and every time, but it's gonna be very unceremonious. It's gonna be pretty boring and it's not gonna have a whole lot of wow to it. It's just gonna be a true consequence. So two energetic reasons why the concept of timeouts in traditional parenting often fail is because while we're delivering the timeout, we're also typically giving energy to the negative, negativity, just like I talked about. In my case, some people, scream and yell and slam doors and throw. I do a little bit of that too, but I'm like the processor. I'm the heavy processor. I'm like, we're gonna talk about this for the next 45 minutes. And I always thought that that was like doing the emotionally sound thing. It was like the worst thing ever. Then what happens is 
even though we had those deep conversations, he would go back two hours later and do the same thing, right? So we haven't set up a new field of energy through a connective relationship. So when the timeouts fail, it's because we're not connected. You don't feel good. So this timeout isn't going to be impactful. And this is what we see constantly. And anybody who's ever used timeouts, we know this in a classroom setting or in a home, they don't really work. So when it comes to stand three, it's just like basketball, right? Or any other sport for that matter. Rules are clear. Both the players and the officials know them and they are non-negotiable. There are no warnings because warnings are dangerous for the intense child. They are immediate, they are quick. And once a rule is broken, there is a consequence for every rule. So a little bit over the line, right, is over the line. A little bit of swearing is swearing. A little bit of disrespect is disrespect. A little bit of pregnant is pregnant, right? So it's like playing hardball every step of the way. There's no warnings because with the warnings, then we're not dependable. There's often inconsistency that couples warnings. So we really wanna step away from that. And for the intense child, if they don't feel a sense of stability or consistency, they are going to buck up against that perimeter every single time. And that's what a power dynamic looks like with a child who oftentimes feels really sensitive, feels really uh, um, you know, overwhelming, or a child that typically has been labeled challenging is that they don't have that safe container to navigate. And so they're constantly trying to figure out their boundary. The other beautiful part that I wanna say about NHA is that perfection is not required. Broken rules simply result in consequences. And then we just lead to getting them back on track. So you could have thrown a book and you could have been really disrespectful and we could have had this moment where it wasn't going well and we're gonna pause the energy, we're gonna reset. And then as soon as that consequence is endured, you're gonna jump right back in the game and I'm gonna be present for you and I'm gonna love you and I'm gonna see you for all your greatness and I'm not gonna hold you who, to who you were at breakfast this morning and I'm not gonna hold you to who you were at detention yesterday. We're just gonna keep going and I'm just gonna keep believing in you. And so it's always doable and then it's not a big deal. So if you choose to break the rules, it's no big deal. So myth four looks like this. You can control a child. And I always laugh at parents when they say this, or even teachers or principals. We have to get, the, we have to get this child under control. I'm like, good luck with that. Unless you are beating your child, which God, I hope you're not, or you are you know, wrestling to the ground or holding them hostage in some way, shape or form. And again, I really hope you're not. That's really the only way that we can control a child. What we can do though, is that we can start to learn how to collaborate with our children and empower them with confidence and choice so that they go out into the world and nine times out of 10, they are making healthy choices. And in the times that they're not, we still love them, we still support them, and then they just have the consequence to work through. But that is all created by their opportunity by knowing that they have that choice available to them. So one of this, my favorite quotes from Howard Glassard is, Children do not awaken to the fear of punishment. They awaken to their greatness. And, you know, I can't say this enough because again, I work with my own work with my own kid. I grew up in a family. We yelled, my mom chased me around the house with a wooden spoon. Again, totally not co-signing on that, but like that's the kind of environment that's, you know, customary. And part of that is that we were all afraid of my mom, but in the long run, that didn't do much for my emotional development. And this is the thing, the intense child, the child who feels insecure, who feels sensitive, that kind of approach is not going to work. It's not gonna work with really any child, but the spe more specifically, it actually does more harm than good at any point in time. And it will exasperate the situation over and over again. We do not want children to move through the world from a place of fear, but rather because they feel confident to do so and they feel enlivened to do so. Transformation is at the core of what NHA is all about. And what we look at is, there's no longer anything to be gained by breaking the rules. So it's boring. You can break the rules. And I always tell when I have kids come into my office and I give them the breakdown, I'm like, you can totally break the rules if you want. Just know this is what will happen if you do. And then they have that choice available to them. When they're not breaking the rules, it's really fun to hang out with me. I'm a really fun mom. I'm a really fun therapist. It's going to be exciting. There's going to be a lot of energy. And when you are collaborating with me and when things are going well, I'm gonna show up really, really powerful, really potent and really big for this relationship because I love you and I want to experience this with you in a deep way because at the core of who we are, we want to engage in meaningful relationships. Meaningful relationships set the stage for really confident adults. 
And lastly, breaking a rule now simply gets a true consequence. It doesn't get the payoff, right? So you're not no longer you're no longer handing them that hundred dollar bill every time they say screw you. Okay. I hope that I was able to cover a lot of the basis of what NHA is, why it's so powerful, and why it really sets the stage for being applicable to all children across across the globe. But again, I want to say this to you one last thing that not only do we use this with children, but when you take this into your homes, into your work life, into your community, relationships change. Ruby is my business partner. We practice NHA with each other. You know, when I go out with my friends who are accustomed to using NHA or familiar, my colleagues, or my peers, we practice NHA with each other because it provides a template or a landscape for us to interrelate with each other in a safe, authentic, caring way that's real and palpable. And at the heart of like who we are, that's what we want to do. We want to be showing up in the most meaningful ways possible. So I'm going to finish there. I'm going to let Ruby jump in and talk to you about what we are offering um, in regards to NHA and moving forward. Let me stop screen sharing. Thank you, Star. Woo, and thank you, everyone, being on here. How are you doing? Is this resonating with you? Head nod, thumbs up. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So good to hear that. I, the first time I found out about NHA, it just was so profound. And having been a mentor for 20 years, it resonated really deeply with things I did innately. And then also was suddenly like these aha moments of like, oh, I could have used this tool. So I hope you've gotten an aha moment and you have something applicable to try today. And if you don't wanna try it with your kids first, try it with your partner or your co-parent or a human, an adult human. I did that first because all of our programs are on hold right now with kids. And I did it in my relationship and it was so cool. So I just wanna share that. Our course, we are so excited. It's the first time offering this course online. This is something STAR has done in person. And with COVID, we've had multiple requests to like, can we do this online? Because quarantine and parenting has had its own unique and special challenges that probably weren't there before or they were there like this and now they're there like hello so I feel this with teachers with parents with educators it has really upped the ante on navigating our relationship with kids and the crazy making that comes from that so we're this course is about guilt-free shame-free and judgment-free parenting and teaching it's about helping you understand deeply and implement the strategies of NHA in your home in your work in the school, wherever you are with kids and humans. And it's about giving you these tools and practices to really revolutionize your parenting and teaching and bring that ease. So we want to give you the gift of time and positive relationships. If you think about all the time in your life with your kids that have you've spent arguing or scolding or being frustrated, like that's a lot of time and it adds up. And with nurtured heart approach, part of what you get is the gift of time because you aren't doing those things. You aren't wasting time arguing or in conflict or trying to figure out what to do. You have appropriate tools. So we I had a questionnaire that you all filled out, many of you filled out. And one of the questions was, what do you want? Like a year from now, imagine something really awesome. No one said, I want a kid who's a genius. No one said, I want my kid to be a world-class piano player. No one said any of these like big, high, crazy things. People were like, I want more connection. And it, like, I'm imagining like more connection. I'm imagining some peace in our household. I'm imagining my kid does chores respectfully, right? We want simple things. Teacher said, I'm imagining more smiles in my classroom. So I want to touch you back into that place of like envisioning the future ahead. If you can get, when you attend this course and you apply these tools, the ease and the fun and like actually having that relationship that you want with the kid in your life will be amazing. So with our course, it's gonna be six weeks. 
It's a five week certified NHA course. Plus we're having a bonus week where Star and I go into some of the most transformational tools that we use in our other program called Camp Quarantine. And this is all about massive growth and change in a way that's both sustainable and empowering in your life with yourself and with everyone else. It is truly amazing. With our Nurture Heart Approach course, we're talking about learning the foundational principles of Nurtured Heart Approach. I know we did a lot today and it's there's even more and where you really start to get an understanding of actually how to use this is in the week by week, taking it apart, unpacking it, looking at it and getting into the depth of what it is and how to apply it. So you will gain a keen understanding and a competence of the three stands of Nurtured Heart Approach. So they just won't be here in your mind. They will be here in your body and how you interact. You will have those clear competencies with the three stands. You'll get those crucial distinctions between energizing and ignoring. So you're gonna have that spot on. You'll learn the importance of the self reset right? How we as adults need to reset ourselves before we even get into consequences and resetting with our kids, right? So you're going to get a tool on how to get back to your center exactly when you need to. You're going to master recognitions. There's four recognitions in Nurtured Heart Approach. It's wicked awesome. Like you don't just have to be like, hey, good job. We're going to give you the ability to master four different styles of recognitions and acknowledgements and how to really start creating these tiny little moments in the day, five seconds here, 10 seconds there. This is not something that's going to require you an hour a day or 30 minutes a day. We're talking, you can put Nurtured Heart Approach from the very first week of our course and start applying it in these little increments and see results now. You're going to learn how to create rules that work for your household or your classroom. You're going to create absolutely clear boundaries, consequences, and limit setting. So if that if you don't even know where to begin, we're going to help you get really clear on those things because that is how nurtured approach approach works is when we're clear on our consequences and limit setting and you will understand and gain confidence about the proper timing, the application of the reset with your child and the youth you work with. So reset is one of the big things and it comes towards the end of the program because if you go and try to do that now, it's not going to work. Things are going to get crazy and you'll be like, ah, oh, what's wrong? It's because you went too far too fast. We got to start here with those mastering the recognitions and then we're really going to help you understand and learn how to implement the reset in a powerful way that is going to bring so much ease and joy back into your parenting and teaching. We're also going to discuss how um, to use nurtured heart approach, not just with your child, but any child you work with. So whether a teacher, a mentor, a foster parent, or any of those places, we're going to make sure you know how to apply NHA across the board and also notching it up. This is a key amazing part of NHA that happens like when you get to that place, we all have been there like, oh, I just don't know what to do. Okay, maybe it's not going to work for me. There's a whole section on what to do when nothing else works and it's called notching it up and you will learn how to master that. So truly every situation, every child, every possible thing you can imagine, you will be able to navigate that. I just want to be like, mic drop. Like, can you imagine how nice life will be with that? We're also going to show you how to develop a bridge to school and back or homeschooling and back or the whatever crazy quarantine thing is going to happen with school and you. We're going to help you figure out how to do that with Nurtured Heart Approach to make sure it's not just something that's in your tiny bubble, but that it can be applied wherever your kid is going in a way that's doable. And also developing a game plan to integrate nurtured heart approach into your family and into your life. So it's not like a thing that we have to do on the side. It's a part of what we get to do to have an amazing family. Everyone is going to benefit who comes into contact with you all when you are operating here. That's one of the beautiful aspects of it. It's, it's truly fantastic. So the course itself, I'm going to show you guys here, is it is six weeks. And week one, we're going to deep dive into nurtured heart approach. This is like all the basics and fundamentals you're going to get 
no problem. Celebrate intensity, keys to success. We're gonna go into week two with a mindset shift. This is so key that one of the biggest things about Nurture Heart Approach is to learn how to see what you are not seeing so that then we can recognize and appreciate differently. And that's where we're gonna start implementing stand one in the home or the school. Week three, we're flipping that script and we are gonna implement stand two and master those recognitions. You're going to have them like this, recognitions, acknowledgements, you got that. Your kids are just gonna be like soaking it up. It's gonna feel so juicy and good. Week five, that's gonna be, or week four, rules that work. This is gonna be so important, setting the limits, how to reset, and implementing stand three. Rules of the game, clear, concise, ready. Week five, notching it up. I'm telling you, when the going gets tough, and we all know it gets tough, you are going to learn how to master the, these three stands together and navigate any of those difficult situations. And week six, anything left over we didn't get to, we can dive in there. And our Camp Q signature blueprint to transform your relationships. It is going